Welcome everyone to tonight's session. We're delighted to have you back. And we're delighted to be here tonight with Charles Eisenstein. And I'll say just a few more words about Charles in a moment. Um, but I want to start by bringing in a few very short pieces of information from the COP26 space today. And some of you who were with us this morning for the interview with um, Sarah Queblatine from the Philippines will have already heard this, but I know it was loud and not everything could be heard perfectly. So I'm just bringing that again. So I happened to be in the big plenary today when Valérie Masson Delmotte from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shared some of their newest findings. And yeah, I think what happens to me also is that somewhere the numbers as I hear them really bring home to me not the irreversibility of climate change, but the intensity of the thrust of change. You know, so even though there is numbers, it speaks about the intensity of a movement that our civilization, or I don't know what the word civilization really means in this context. Maybe that's something we can speak about with Charles but just the movement that humanity is co-instigating or is part of at this time. Yeah, so she was saying that they have better climate information than ever before. So just the way that all countries are turning an attention towards this and are really installing more precision in how the climate information is being collected and amalgamated is, um, yeah, is just delivering a very different kind of data from 20 years ago. And they're very careful to phrase everything they say in words that are, you know, can't be questioned. So the central outcome is that recent changes in climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying. And then there is a lot of information, of course, about the hottest years on record and the increase in heavy rainfall and hurricanes and tornadoes and the sea level rise. At the moment, we are at a stage where we have 47% more carbon in our atmosphere than pre-industrial state. We have 156% more methane above pre-industrial levels in our atmosphere and 23% nitro nitrogen oxide, yeah. And together, this shield around our planet, which keeps the sunlight in, is warming up our Earth. And interestingly enough, it's warming up 1% of the energy that is being kept, 1% of the energy that is being kept moves into the atmosphere. 3% goes into the melting of the ice caps. 4% is absorbed by the land. And 93% of the energy is absorbed by the world's oceans. So there is a huge shift in the way in the atmosphere in the ocean. Not only are sea, le you know, sea level rising at 3.7 millimeter per year currently 
and this has been going on for many years. So I remember places I visited on the west coast of Africa where whole villages are gone already. And we know the same is true for the islands in the Pacific and many other places. Oxygen available in the ocean. And all these changes that we are seeing are unprecedented, not just in the past thousands of years, but some of them like the acidification of the ocean, they can prove that it is unprecedented for at least the past two million years. Yeah, so I leave it at that. You know, we also had a global social witnessing event this afternoon, which was really grappling with how to do these in that space. But we had some representatives of the Turkish and the Peruvian government really reconnecting to as they saw images of animals really reconnecting to the original motivation that brought them into this work. And also the, how difficult it is to speak about the emotional content of what this triggers in us in the climate change negotiations. Yeah, it's, it's very much the, the mental level that is in the foreground. Yeah, so I'm delighted to be back with Charles. Charles and I have met a few times over the years. And, um, you know, I'm a, I remember the first time, I think, um, in, what was it called? Um, Squat Wall Street, I want to say. I'm sorry, my brain is very full. <laughs> Help me, guys. Um, but I um, Occupy Wall Street. Thank you. There you go. My better English comes forward. Um, Occupy Wall Street was the first time, I think, when I saw Charles speak just on, an, on a YouTube clip and he was speaking about the power of love to transform our world. And I've been a fan ever since then. And we've met in Fintorn. We've met at a Gen Conference of, of the Global Eco, Eco Village Network. And I just love um, Charles' dedication to the gift economy, um, to heartfulness, and also to speaking out of the moment, and many other things. So Charles Eisenstein is an essayist and the author of several books, including The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know is Possible. And Charles, I would like to start right there, just with this question of um, whether you might be able to tell me a bit about this more beautiful world we know is possible in our heart of hearts. And yet in the light of the climate crisis, um, is it still possible? Do we still know it's possible? Yeah, well, thank you, Kasha. So good to be here with you again, at least virtually. Um, yeah, all that information that you gave does a pretty good job convincing the mind that a more beautiful world is not possible. Uh, maybe we cling to some threads of hope, but as many of the critics of COP26 will say, even the most radical proposals on the agenda are too little, too late, and they can make a pretty strong case for despair. Yet, at the same time, um, there's part of me that doesn't believe it. And part of my work is to reconcile this heart's knowing with the logic and the cognition of the mind. So that heart and mind can be in unison. Um, Yeah, because to trust what the heart knows beyond evidence uh, in times of the breakdown of sense and meaning in our world, 
in times of so much conflicting, polarizing information coming in from every direction, sometimes the, the faculties of the mind no longer can provide us with an accurate navigation system. So I'm speaking also to the, like this is, so this is illogic, okay? Or some kind of uh, teleological logic some backwards logic, but it makes sense to the heart. For example, that I know that it is possible. I know that earth healing is possible. I know that a more beautiful world is possible because if it were impossible, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. We're not put here on earth to, for, for no reason, you know, like, like our very presence and our the, our very care, um, our, our dedication is testament to the possibility of what we are trying to achieve. doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but it's possible. And now moving into the logic of the mind, I think many of us realize, many of you um, present with us today understand that technically climate change would be very easy to solve. All we would have to do is convert not even all, but maybe half of the world's agricultural lands into regenerative practices. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, with the research on soil sequestration of carbon and how fast that can actually happen in school. Back you know, 40 years ago, I learned that it takes 100 years to grow an inch of topsoil, but there are farmers out there doing it in you know, two years. So, so that's just one example of what happens when we actually turn our collective human attention and creativity toward its true purpose. And who, who am I to declare what our true purpose is? I'm just speaking it so that you recognize its truth. We are obviously here to contribute, to participate in life to contribute to the life and beauty of this earth. That maybe has not been so obvious in the former age, which was about the growth of the human realm, but it's pretty obvious now. So, and excuse me, I have a very bad cold. So if I'm even uh, slower than usual, that's why. Um, yeah, so, so, Right, uh, regenerative agriculture, or imagine if we put half the world's oceans, uh, I'm just saying half, okay? Let's not make it too hard, in marine conservation zones so that the fish stocks could recover. And, and what if we put a moratorium on coastal wetlands development and, and began to recover those lands too, and, and inland wetlands? Like <clears throat> these, you can, you can, um, evaluate these policies based on carbon numbers. But I think that they are even more powerful than the carbon numbers indicate. And in fact, um, as a lifelong environmentalist, like, like literally since I was a little boy, um, I think that the environmental movement has gotten a little too caught up in global warming as its defining issue. Because for me, I even if global warming stopped, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't make me say, oh, okay, good, full steam ahead. Let's continue building pipelines, let's continue fracking, let's continue cutting down the forests, et cetera, et cetera. I'm in this for love of life. And I know that as long as we do not treat earth as sacred and life as sacred and precious, and as long as we continue to see earth as a thing, as a source of resources, and as long as we continue to only make decisions based on the calculable effect on ourselves, as if we were making decisions about how to use a, a, a bank account, you know, or 
um, you know, some something else that like a tool, as long as we do that, then the planet is going to continue to die. It's going to the derangement of its systems, including the climate, is going to continue to intensify, even if we bring emissions to zero. Climate derangement, climate chaos, the dying of the earth is a reflection of our of the way that we hold and relate to the earth, hold it as a dead thing, and it becomes a dead thing because we are acting in alignment with that future. So what I see with great hope in the climate movement is a deep dedication toward changing our ways into alignment with <clears throat> The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, you know, in alignment with our care, with our love for this earth. It's like it's the feeling of enough, enough. We cannot continue like this anymore. We don't want to continue like this anymore. And you know, it actually hasn't even been that great, this trajectory we've been on. Even if the ecosystem, a planetary ecosystem was doing just fine, has all of our economic growth and our technological growth, the incursion of technology into every sphere of human interaction, <coughs> has that actually made us happier? No. There are so many indications, inner and outer, within ourselves, within our society, and in the planetary ecosystem, <coughs> excuse me, that the story we have lived in, the path that we have been on, is over. Externally, it's not sustainable. Internally, we're done with it. And there's even part of me that when I read about the latest catastrophic uh, events, there's that, 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 put unsustainability in our face. I'm like, good, because I want out. I, 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 I don't want to be in this story and in this society that's been built upon it. So this is what I see with great hope in the climate movement. And with what I see with a degree of alarm is the hijacking of the movement into thought forms that are actually part of the old story. One of them is instrumental utilitarianism. You know, how do we administer this thing called Earth, these, this scum of biochemistry called nature? How do we administer it to our best advantage the most sustainably? And another thought pattern is reductionism, carbon reductionism, the idea that, that we can equate environmental sustainability and the health of the planet with one metric. In fact, the reason that the regenerative agriculture, the, the um, marine preserves, the, the uh, reforestation, et cetera, et cetera, the wetlands conservation, the reason that these are so potent as in their healing possibilities and Kasha, if, if I've gone on too long, you can let me know, but I'll, I'll just, I'll wrap it up real soon. Um, the reason that, that these policies are so potent um, beyond, like on one level, yeah, okay, there's the carbon level. On another level, it's because they enact a relationship of love between ourselves and the beings of earth. And also, and I think this is the most important, is that Earth is a living being, and its organs are things like forests, wetlands, estuaries, uh, oceans, soil, water. Like these are the organs of a living being. And if we continue to degrade the organs, then whatever happens to carbon dioxide and methane and, and nitrous oxide, et cetera, et cetera, Earth will still die a death of a million cuts. So, so, for example, like, how does this happen? Like, 
this, this is not just a poetic metaphor to speak of the Earth's physiology in terms of these organs. Like for example, the Amazon rainforest uh, acts as a biotic pump, which, which because it evaporates so much water through the, the transpiration through its leaves, that, that when the water rises and condenses, it creates a low pressure zone that pulls even more uh, air up and then ultimately pulls, that, pulls it in from the oceans, creating a, what they call in Brazil a flying river. All large forests do this kind of thing and, and basically anchor the entire flow of moisture uh, on Earth. And, and um, like I could talk about whales and how they, um, they bring up nutrients from the depths to the surface. And then that's where they poop, you know, and, and create, um, uh, they, they bring the nourishment so that, that algae and plankton and microorganisms can grow and anchor the food chain and you get rid of the whales. And that whole process, and we have less than 10% of the whales we used to, that whole process is interrupted. Uh, and I could go on and on, like fish, birds, migratory animals. These are all vectors of flow on a living world. So when we interrupt those, for example, there's a development belt now um, on, um, on the, the, between the Andes and, and the Amazon. Like there's like huge development going on there that interrupts wildlife corridors. The rainforest starts to die independent of climate change or not actually independent, but mutually dependent on climate change, ex exacerbated by global climate change, but also contributing to it because the stabilizing effect of this ecosystem is gone. So I would like to see, um, yeah, and, and just one more real quick, sorry. Um, the, <sighs> hmm, should I say that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Earth can withstand, um, large and rapid fluctuations in temperature, if its organs are strong. It's happened before. Uh, you know, I read um, a lot on this issue, uh, including um, the, the skeptics, you know, and, you know, there's pretty good reason to think that, that temperatures in the Roman warm period, for example, were higher than today, much higher, even, uh, you know, tree lines were hundreds of meters uh, higher and hundreds of kilometers farther north, you know, there's coastal settlements that um, are now hundreds of meters inland, you know, and, and, and not like, like Earth could withstand that, but not if the organs are damaged. And the difference between <clears throat> then and now is that, you know, like, I mean, enormous, enormous damage, 80% of the um, uh, seagrass meadows in New England are gone. At least 50% of the mangrove swamps in Southeast Asia are gone. Uh, the Congo rainforest is, is being, being leveled even faster than the Amazon, which is disappearing at a rate of six football fields per you know, 10 minutes. I mean, the, the, this is what, what alarms me is this wholesale destruction of life on earth and the industrial fishing you know, and, and the toxic pollution that's, that's destroying life everywhere, the insect Armageddon. Um, I mean, it's okay. It is time to stop. It is time to stop. And it is time to align our immense creativity toward its true purpose, which again, to serve life and beauty on earth. When we do that, this problem is technically easy. It's just a shift of consciousness away. And just to say, Charles, when you're in a flow, I do nothing. There's little that I enjoy more than listening. So please, for the rest of tonight, at least don't apologize when you're in a flow because it's lovely. 
Yeah, I just wasn't sure yeah. about our format, you know, like- was No, I mean, this format, here. no. I mean, we call it conversation because, you know, in a way you're having a conversation with all of us, you know, because we're also here um, calling you forth into our reality. So, but, you know, what we want is what comes through you, so. Yeah, and I really love the clarity of what you said around when we hold the earth as dead, we create a dead earth. And also, you know, that, that means if we hold the earth as sacred, if we hold life as sacred, and that is how, how we go into each day, we bring life back as sacred. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, I wonder about this question of how much good can one person do? Like how many people, you know, how do we do this? Because I agree, it feels so close and my heart can feel it. And I go into my own garden and converse with our little Robin, you know, or with a plant and I, ah, you know, lockdown has been fantastic for that for so many of us. So yeah, mm -hmm. how much yeah. good can one person do? How much good can I do? How much good can Anya or Barbara do who are here? One of, yeah, one of the uh, obstacles to, full service, and I'm speaking not only for myself here, because I know many other people experience it in a similar way. One of the obstacles to full service is the ideology of scale, that what I'm doing doesn't really matter that much because I'm just one person and, and it's just lost in the deluge of, of destruction like what does it matter if i you know recycle my bottles or plant my garden or take care of one little plot of earth when everybody else is not doing it i would be maybe earth would be better off if i ignored my garden oh boy yum 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 thank you <laughs> the enforcement's here oh we're so happy we can all feel that now in our bodies. Yeah, it's like That's ginger great. and stuff, really good. Oh, okay. very nice. Yeah. So, right. So, like this scale based thinking is like, you know, Charles, there you are spending all your time in your garden, but you have a big audience. Like, you should be pumping out more. Like every hour you spend on your garden, that's like one hour less. You could be affecting, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. That way of thinking is part of the problem. It's based on a mechanistic conception of reality and causality that validates the large and denigrates the small. Our, it's an industrial mindset and it's part of the same industrial mindset that you know typifies industry that is destroying the planet on an industrial scale for industrial purposes so part of the transition that is before us is to is out of that kind of economy not that we won't have any industry but it's a reclamation of many aspects of human activity from industrialism because Industrialism has fulfilled and over, over fulfilled the quantifiable needs of humanity. And I say that with full awareness that there are something like 20 or 30,000 people dying of hunger every day. Okay. That's not because of insufficient food. It's because of maldistribution. There's plenty to feed everybody on earth easily, even with 
uh, you know, regenerative agriculture, which actually can outproduce industrial agriculture if it's done correctly. So, yeah, uh, so, so it overfulfills our quantifiable needs and underfulfills our qualitative needs. The need, for example, to belong, the need for intimacy, the need for connection. These cannot be met on an industrial scale. They're fundamentally local, they're fundamentally personal, they're unique. They're, they're, they're relationships that nourish the soul are not standardized. They cannot be mass produced, they're unique. And a, our, our current market high-tech economy replaces a lot of those interactions with generic standard uh, technologically and money mediated um, needs. So <clears throat> yeah, so, so this whole mindset of scale at its very core is part of the way of thinking that has gotten us here. And as everybody knows, Albert Einstein said, our problems will not be solved at the same level of thinking that created them. So the transition, and I'm not, okay, so yeah, plant your garden and do everything that you understand in your body to be in service to life and beauty. And when the skeptical mind says, well, that's not enough, it's not big enough, it doesn't scale, it's not gonna go viral, you know? Unless maybe I video myself in my garden and then it can go viral and inspire other people and then it's justified. No, actually it seems maybe even preachy that way. Maybe the way that it goes viral is that somebody surreptitiously videos me doing some act of kindness to the earth. And I didn't even plan it out that way because the, here is the deeper principle. No act is wasted. Gaia feels everything. Or to put it in religious terms, God sees everything. Or in Buddhist terms, like every act generates a, a, an effect. Acts have consequences. It has karma. It comes back to you. And it affects all beings. Or to put it in Rupert Sheldrake's terms, it creates a amorphic field. So your gardening, your love of earth creates, creates a morphic field of love and people elsewhere start gardening too and start caring for earth in their own way. Maybe it's not a garden. Maybe it is, uh, I know like these guerrilla uh, ecosystem restoration guys who like, in fact, I even met a guy in, in a forest service and they were like, you know, these guys are like in the state forest service and they're, when they like, selectively fell trees. They're like making sure to contour them with the land to help retain water. And like, they're just, they're like doing stuff that's not official policy. This, they're part of the field too. So I'm not saying, however, only do small scale stuff, local personal stuff, and forget about the big stuff, forget about trying to change the system. What I wanna do in these words is to validate both and to, to say, we don't know actually how to change a system governed by forces far more powerful than ourselves, where at COP26, even the most radical proposals are not enough and what's practical is woefully insufficient. And how do we do it? Like you hit a dead end of despair that way. But, and, and, and in a certain sense, the despair is justifiable given the dominant industrial scale-based way of thinking and the causality of force, where the world has no intelligence of its own and we have to impose human intelligence onto it to make things happen. In that mindset, yeah, it's hopeless. And your small contributions are meaningless. But that is the very logic that is underneath the world destroying machine. And we can listen to something else. And if everybody starts listening to that, if we spread that, then the world destroying machine loses its foundation. 
we stop complying with it. So I want to, you know, without invalidating the systems level work, I want to validate and put on an equal, at least equal footing, the work that the heart's logic calls us to do. That's so, I love what you just said, like Mother Gaia sees everything you do, you think, you feel, and, you know, like God sees everything you do. And yesterday I had, I found myself saying um, when I was speaking to someone about regenerative agriculture, I, I was say, found myself saying that in my experience, when I take one step towards nature, nature takes a hundred steps towards me. And it's the same, you know, the same saying with God. So it's interesting that parallel, you know, in my experience, like building eco villages, my experience has been like you, you bring a bit of love and care into a previously um, completely industrial agricultural landscape, a little bit of love and care, you start spreading just a bit of diversity and seeds and I don't even know where they all come from. All these creatures and insects and frogs and birds, and they just all come, it's like they come from nowhere, you know? And to me, it has been astonishing. And I've also for a while really researched photographs, you know, 10 years ago, 10 years later. And it's astonishing the transformation that is possible once we start working with nature. Mm. Yeah, um, it, there is like a kind of a miraculous level to it. It's as if uh, we shapeshift into a reality in which these beings now exist again. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, you might be able to, <coughs> excuse me, rationally explain how they came back and stuff, but sometimes it just seems uncanny, you know? <clears throat> And this is also a, a hint at, <clears throat> oh my gosh, a hint at another causal principle that you that you put very beautifully to, when you take one step toward God, God takes a hundred steps towards you. Um, the, the small acts of love and of letting go of control, they, and, 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 and faith, like you do things with no guarantee of success and even no guarantee that you'll be okay. Those are kind of a prayer. They demonstrate to whatever being receives prayers that you're serious about it. Um, they are an alignment of yourself with the future that you want to see, much more than any words can be. So I'm not surprised that you experienced that, Kersha, the, the, like the, um, the healing just popping up around you as you step into a world of healing. I mean, it's similar to what I was saying earlier that, that when we hold earth as alive and sacred and we align our actions to that, that is like a kind of magic and earth responds like we are it's like we're actually stepping into a reality in which earth is alive and sacred and if earth is alive then we have um access to allies to the powers of the land the powers of the mountain the powers of the river and the oceans that that indigenous people recognize and 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 speak of like, and the skeptic, you know, is like, oh, well, if the ocean is so powerful, if the mountain is so powerful, then why haven't they stopped the destruction if they're so powerful? The reason is that we have, through the, boy, this is going to get really esoteric, but through the system of magic that we call science and industry, we have exited the reality in which they are powerful. They're still waiting for us. 
to, they're, but they're not going to beat humanity at its own game. This is a, a fallacy that, that uh, nature is finally going to rise up and take its revenge. Our graduation into maturity as a species, or at least as a civilization, is that we make the choice to serve life. We don't, we're not forced into doing it. Anytime I, I, I hear people say that, well, now climate change is going to force us to enact these environmental policies. <clears throat> not necessarily. Uh, I can envision a future in which we um, meet the degradation of nature with technological substitutes. They're already being developed. Synthetic food, you know, lab-grown food, hydroponics factories for the, where there's no soil anymore, where the plant roots get fed all the right nutrients, um, carbon sucking machines to pull carbon out of the air, the conversion of land masses into biofuels plantations, the conversion of rivers into sources of hydropower. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the same, <laughs> the same trajectory that we've been on. And why do you think it's gonna stop all by itself? I don't think it is. I think we could end up on a concrete world where humans by the metrics that we use are just fine but nature's dead. I mean, we've seen visions of that and of, of the you know, futurism of the 1950s and 1960s. So if we are gonna have a different future, I think it is gonna be not because we are forced to, but because we choose to. And, and so then I look at what values and perceptions base this choice? What needs to be awakened in the human being for us to value life and choose life. Once that is awakened, then, I mean, I don't know how it's gonna play out on a systems level, but I know that we will find a way. And without that being awakened, if all we have is technocratic solutions to one crisis after another, then you know we're gonna continue on this. I and mean, this is good news and bad news. Climate change isn't gonna save us from ourselves but we can always make a different choice. The choice is always available. And when we choose collectively to heal, the healing powers that are unleashed, the allies that become available from the mentality of healing, it's not that we heal the earth, it's that we ask, what do you need? We relate to earth as a being, we tune in. The new technology, the technology of the future is a technology that begins with listening. And it takes the form of participation. And then those miracles that you speak of are, 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 are possible. Yeah, I love it. So right now I want to go in two directions, but I'll go in one because that's where you're just closest to right now. And I want to come closer to the topic that we are also bringing into COP26, which is you know, how we need to bring a knowledge about the places where we're absent, where we carry trauma to our attempt at changing and bring a compassion to the pain that we all carry in our hearts. You know, just to name it like that, the pain that we carry in our hearts that keeps us from believing that if I turn to this plant and love this plant fully, that will mean something. You know, there is like a, a pain and a separation and feelings of guilt and feelings of shame, even at being a human at this time. I believe that, and yeah, a lot of weight that we carry from the past that is also keeping us away from that. How do you see that? How do you work with that? Well, there's a lot in that, Kosha. Um, uh, the, the guilt and shame of being human. Um, I don't resonate with it. Because 
I don't resonate with anthropocentrism and human exceptionalism. One expression of human exceptionalism, anthropocentrism, is to say that, yeah, we're special, we're destined to rule over the rest of nature and to, to use all other beings simply for our, like that's one toxic form. But it's essentially the same mindset to say, we're nature's big mistake. We're bad. What we are is life. That's what you are. That's what I am. We are life taking the form that life takes, doing the things that life does in our particular combination of circumstances. <clears throat> right now, that combination of circumstances involves, as you were saying, tremendous trauma. What does life do when it's traumatized? It can grow in very strange, crooked ways as it tries to get back to wholeness. I like to sometimes point, point out that, that uh, we have a tree around here. And I'm like, it's a bad tree. Look how crooked it is. Look how gnarled it is. Look how stunted it is. Bad tree. That one's bad. That one doesn't know how to grow. We should cut it down and, and only have good trees. Well, that assessment is based on ignorance. And if I knew the occluded sunlight and rocky soil and, and physical challenges that that tree had to endure, I would understand why it grew that way. And we're the same. And I'm not speaking only of people who are like traumatized in an obvious way through abuse, through economic oppression, you know, through misogyny, racism, et cetera, et cetera. The extreme examples of trauma are bellwethers um, that indicate a general state. And a lot of the trauma in our civilization is normalized. We don't even recognize it as trauma. We don't recognize it as trauma to take a child, for example. Um, well, I mean, starting at birth, take the child away from the mother at birth and subject him or her to isolation in a, in a, in a nursery and to get picked up every two hours and mutilated um, if it's a boy, you know, without anesthetic on the most sensitive part of his body. And, and like this, it goes on and on and on. Or to take a child and, and daycare, it's normal. You put a child, he develops a bond to this caregiver. And then, and then the next year, another caregiver, another bond. And then next year, another one and another one. Like, or, or today, like the trauma of spending all day, like most of their time, not seeing another human expression, you know, to be masked all day. Like there are so many uh, subtle, normalized forms of trauma. The trauma of not, of like, I mean, here you are ready to connect, ready to belong to a place and you're indoors all the time. And, and, and like among strangers, like, I mean, I'm, you know, kind of a nature oriented guy, but I don't even know the names of a lot of the trees out there, let alone like what medicine you can make out of them or their stories or what they're for. Um, how they relate, because they don't relate to me anymore, because I'm connected to, you know, via money and technology, I'm connected in through my, my, my diet, mostly through plants to plants and animals that grew up that that grew a long way away from here. Like, so this stripping of relationality is traumatic. And that is what has made us who we are today. But just like that tree trying to grow back toward the sunlight, trying to grow back toward the water, trying to heal, we are the same because we are the same as the tree. We are life. And so we have an unquenchable yearning to recover our lost wholeness, to rebuild the connections that have been sundered, to, to, to belong again on earth. That's, that's unquenchable. And it keeps trying and keeps trying and keeps trying to, to get out. Because we are life, there is always hope because, because we will always strive to fulfill the life within us. 
And if you recognize that, then you might recognize the guilt and the shame as maybe even counterproductive because it, it encodes I'm bad. And if you believe I'm bad, well, what about the people driving the SUVs and flying in the private jets and you know fracking for oil and stuff? Like they're really bad. And here you are in trying to persuade them to change their ways to enact different policies maybe. And underneath you have a belief that you're bad. What kind of story are you holding? What kind of invitation are you making to them? If you cannot see, it's the same as when we don't see earth as alive. How can we invite earth to become more alive? When we see another person as some degraded form of life, not, not sacred, not like me yearning toward wholeness, not here, to serve life and beauty on earth. When we discount and dehumanize others like that, then we can never be an invitation to, to, for them to um, fulfill that purpose of serving life. We can never speak to that part of them because we don't see it. But when we are able to see that biophilia in other people, then we're able to speak to it. We can invite them to act on it with courage because it takes courage, you know, to go against them. I mean, if you're, so suppose you are a, a, an executive in a fracking company, it takes courage to go against your subculture, to go against your economic interests, to risk losing your job. How does, where does courage come from? Let's recognize this. It takes courage to change. Therefore, we ask, where does courage come from? Does it come from being pummeled and shamed and into self-disgust so finally you'll change? No, that's force. Courage for me comes when others see that which in me that wants to ex be expressed. I'm To the extent that I'm courageous, it's because of others holding me in what I can be. So anyway, this was you know, quite a roundabout way to say <coughs> that the guilt and shame set us up in a endless war, a war against ourselves, a war against each other, all of which mirror the war on nature. And the alternative is to accept ourselves for who we really are, which is, again, life. Yeah, beautifully said. And, you know, just to, from where I sit, it feels like that aspect of low self-esteem, shame, guilt, is one of the symptoms of trauma, like normalized trauma. It's become normal to have low self-esteem or the other side of the coin arrogance you know but to have the dignity to be a human life within life and you know bringing our love to the difficult places as you so beautifully said has to start with ourselves like bringing love to those places where it's difficult to love ourselves mm -hmm. and I I know it from myself and I know it from the people I know intimately you know, that all of us have those deep moments of self-doubt. Um, when we do the things that we know in our hearts are the most beautiful things we need to be doing. And it feels like, uh, you know, something that follows us, that doubt. Or, you know, Thomas sometimes, Thomas Hubel sometimes speaks about the fellowship of the rings and that you just need to bring the fellowship along, you know, and they come like the hobbits and the dwarves. You have fear walking with you. You have doubt walking with you and, you know, tend to them with kindness and not, you know, in a way, you know, just like everything else you just spoke about that there is, you know, not to polarize, not to distance, but to understand that this is a part of us and love it into change instead of push it away into into change and there's something about discovering the beauty in doubt and changing it 
with care is I'm interested in, you know, because it runs so deep in the people I know who are really going for change. And also, to be quite honest, in the organizations and the communities and the movements that I know, some of the places where the most beautiful change is happening, there is deep expressions of self-doubt and... Um, yeah, and also doubting each other. That is really, it, it feels like sand in the system, you know? Mm -hmm. So what is the sand in the system? Because I feel like there's more and more of us waking up at this time. There's more and more of us waking up in our hearts and turning towards life. And yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yeah, I've certainly gone through a lot, a lot of doubt in the last couple of years. Um, and I've learned to distinguish between two kinds. One is a doubt in my opinions. And that leads to an inquiry of why do I believe what I believe? Am I willing to be wrong? Um, and am I serving establishing that I'm right or am I actually serving what I'm here to serve? Like that kind of doubt I think is, is a growth process and everybody needs to go through that sometime. Otherwise you become dogmatic and um, you know, especially, especially if you're in the business of saving the world, you really need to have some doubt because so much harm has been done by people trying to save the world historically. Another kind of doubt I've learned is really toxic. It's the kind of doubt where, where I'm doubting what I've actually experienced and know to be true from direct experience, where I come to doubt like deeply held values and convictions. And I start to gaslight myself. I start to be like, well, you didn't actually see that. You don't actually know that. How would you know? Who are you to actually know that? And yeah, that kind of <clears throat> self-doubt is paralyzing. So <clears throat> I'm not like going to try to give you instructions on how to distinguish it, but just um, laying that out might be helpful for, for some people. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I just love also that we're looking at this, you know, because there's something about shifting the narrative, for instance, shifting to a new story, which takes, as you said, a lot of courage. And you know, already <coughs> spoke about the language that is being used in the sphere of climate change. And it's just astonishing the amount of fighting and countdown uh, sorry I, I shouldn't be you know but it's just like it's it's everything is very like you know heated up very fast very aggressive language that is being used um which is interesting in the creation of something you know it just feels like it goes in the same direction so yeah take, and, and you might even like um <clears throat> One thing I think about sometimes is the connection between the global climate, like the you know ecological planetary climate and the political climate, the right. social climate, the economic climate, the psychic climate. It kind of makes sense that when, when we are in the midst of heated controversies and inflammatory rhetoric and seething resentment, and incendiary statements, you know, and raging disagreements, et cetera, et cetera, like all of these fire metaphors, he, these heated debates, right? It makes sense that the atmosphere is gonna be getting hotter. And like, you could treat that as a poetic metaphor, but you could also look at, okay, given that it is actually technically easy to solve climate change, why aren't we doing it? The reason we're not doing it, the reason we are on a trajectory that almost nobody actually wants to be on is because of a crisis in communication. 
it is a crisis in the foremost power of the human being, which is the power of the word. That's how we are. That's how human beings can create such miracles. It's through agreement. When society unites toward a common aim, there's almost no limit on what we can create. Today, we are at odds with ourselves. That means that we are basically just subject to inertia, helplessly careening along the same trajectory that we've been on because we're not actually in our power as humans. So it's more than a metaphor, this connection between the social climate and the planetary climate. They are closely related. Yeah, and it's so interesting because today we were in a situation where we were with a delegate who started crying in a, you know, she was so touched, she started crying. And her first sentence was, I just hope my, none of my colleagues see this. Oh, gosh. You know, all of her no, colleagues I'm, see it. Oh, my God. Exactly. But, you yeah. know, it's like we live in a world where we're to be heated up and passionate. You know, I mean, passionate. I love passion. I am passionate sometimes you know i am but um we're to be seen crying about the state of the world to to be seen crying about the fact that we only have 10 percent of the whales left to be seen crying just because my heart bursts open because i've seen dolphins or i've met a whale you know is seen as um, something that you don't want to show in public. Well, there's a reason for that, like an ideological reason for that, which is that when we worship the God science, one of that God's edicts is that you make your decisions scientifically. You make your decisions by the numbers. So there's this ideal of, of putting emotion to the side and okay, fine. Okay. You're crying. Okay. Now, you know, sober up. Now let's look at the numbers. Let's look at policy A, policy B. What are the carbon numbers for this? What's the cost? What's the benefit? That's how we're supposed to make decisions. We're supposed to make them based on calculation, not on emotion, because that could lead you astray. That's, that's like part of the ideology of, I call it the cult of quantity. The idea, and it goes, to a very deep root um, that, I mean, you could take it maybe all the way back to Pythagoras, uh, but certainly back to Galileo and, and um, the scientific revolution, you know, that what is real is what can be measured and human advancement means extending measure to more and more things. And then we can rationally solve our problems. And it, yeah, it sounds good. You know, let's put the whole world into a big data set and rationally administer it and, and track every single object and person and manipulate nature down to the nano level and let's, let's get it all under control. Sounds good. Does it actually work? No. And each failure of quantity, of measure, of control is met with even more of it as we push this program to totality and, 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 and totalitarianism the program of control. So this is um, the reduction of the world to number. Actually, you could also say is the cause through a certain lens of climate change. When we reduce nature to number, when we reduce forests to board feet and you know yield per dollar and so forth, when we only see through the lens of number, then where's the emotion? Where's the love? Where's the view of, of the beingness of that which we have liquidated? So that, that reductionistic mindset um, is, is you know, indirectly at least related to the um, discarding of emotion, of the feminine, you know, of like this, this linear abstracting quality it's um archetypally it's like a it's a masculine quality not that women can't do it but you know it's a it's um a, i would say a, 
it's part of the mix, you know, it's not a bad thing, but when it's disconnected from the qualitative, from the feminine, from nature, from relationship, from emotion, from the heart, then it, you know, creates immense destruction. Yeah, beautiful. And, you know, just to honor the mystical nature of numbers as well, when it is connected to the universe and to the feminine principle. And yeah, you know what, I would love to end asking you about the power of love, you know, to come back to that, like the the first sentence I heard you say that really touched me just about the power of love to transform the world. And then I would love us to give space. We have around 20 minutes left, so not so much, but just for maybe one, two questions from our audience yeah. or our beautiful community here, <laughs> a beautiful participation here. One way that I understand love is as an expansion of myself to include another person. When I love my child, then I'm not separate from him. I, I, um, his happiness is my happiness. You know, I'm happy just because he's happy. Um, even though like I'm you know, here, I'm him and he, I'm me and he's him. Like, why, why, why should I care? If he's happy or if he's in pain, but he's my child. Of course I care because I love him. And as we love, as we, we fall back in love with, with nature, with earth, then the suffering of the planet, we suffer too. Not because we make a calculation that the death of this forest is going to contribute X megatons of carbon to the atmosphere. It's because we love the forest. I think that without that, our, I said it before, our technological solutions will get us only deeper in the hole. When we calculate the, you know, carbon savings from building a big hydro dam or a nuclear power plant or a solar farm, something gets left out of the calculations and it ends up causing more harm than good. That's not the answer. When we fall back in love with the living beings of earth, then we take care of them even when we don't understand why in the calculations. Like, I could actually make a really good argument that whales contribute enormously to carbon sequestration. But I'd be lying to you if I said that's why we should save the whales. You know, it has to do with the nutrient transport and the growth of coxolithophores that make calcium carbonate shells, which then sink to the bottom of the ocean. And I mean, I can make all kinds of arguments why whales contribute to decarbonization. But if I said that's, yeah, I'm be, I'm, that's not why. I mean, that might be a convenient argument to appeal to, um, you know, the current discourse of power, but that's not why. And how hard am I really going to try when I appeal to anything but love? How hard are you going to try? If I appeal to Here's the cost savings you will get if you go green, if your company goes green. I'm also affirming that you should make decisions based on profit, not on love. Do it because you will save money. That's not going to do much good because usually what is going to increase your profits is not what is going to um, protect and heal life on earth. 
that's where the courage comes in. Usually you have to make a choice. What are you choosing? Love or something else? That's the power of love. It animates the choices that, like, I, I don't even want to say that we need to make. Need for what? Need to make to save the earth? It animates the choices that lead to a beautiful living earth. That's the path that leads to that. Yeah, wonderful. And I also love what Thomas said is true love starts in the places where it's not easy to love. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, the, like the next step around love or the practice of love and just putting that central to our life. It's so easily said, but to actually live that in this world is creating a new story. Yeah, thank you so much. I've, I've loved that and just, yeah, really appreciating. And I would love you to invite anybody now who would love to just bring a question, trigger something different. If you would like to, you can just raise your hand. You could also write in the chat if you have a question and you don't want to come online. I've had actually a question from come in. Hmm. Yes, Garrity. And Evan, let's see whether we can give space to both of you. Let's see how far we get. Over to you, Gertie. And then, oh, there, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Charles and Kasha. I've really enjoyed your days here and uh, really appreciate it. Um, I was at a conference, online Zoom conference with students from the University of Victoria. And um, the topic was um, stu students and faculty and some members of the community as well were on the panel. And there were a group of students, uh, young women from a high school I'm talking about climate, the climate crisis, and how how youth are, are doing with this. And um, one of these young women from woman woman from the high school said, "Why weren't we taught to love the earth from the very beginning? Why isn't that taught in school? If we would love the earth," she said, "we we wouldn't be in this mess right now if everybody loved earth." So I uh, just really appreciate Charles what you said. That's really and you know I was thinking you know as part of. Uh, Christian communities, we were taught to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we also were taught to love the earth with all our heart, soul, and mind? Mm -hmm. I was so moved by, by these young women. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, really feeling that, that the spirit of that young woman now. Uh, you know, thinking of I don't know, I didn't go to Catholic school, but you know, does it actually work to instruct the children in their classroom to love God with all their heart, soul, and mind? Don't think so. Um, and by the same token, you take somebody out of nature, you put them in a square box, sit them in a row, and instruct them to love nature while the very architecture of the school and the, the social architecture of school and of the class actually separates you from nature. That's really a mixed message. Maybe we need to completely rethink what school is or even think should there be school. Um, yeah. Mass compulsory schooling only began 150 years ago. Maybe children should learn in a very different way. Maybe they should learn in and from nature. Maybe they, maybe, and to do that, they need to be integrated into an adult community that also is 
that also participates in nature. So it's not just you take kids out of school, then they're in their, you know, suburban box, staring at another box, also separate from nature. I mean, the, the, the healing is vast that we are facing right now. Um, school as we know it and its curriculum exists in the matrix of modern life as we know it. And here's one thing that the climate movement sometimes understands, which is that, but too often doesn't, which is that for us to solve the climate crisis, everything has to change. It is an indicator of our holistic state of being and um, an expression of it, even a symptom of it. And we need to be prepared now to put everything on the table. And one of those things is school. Yeah. Is it okay for me to go still? Wait, Scott, I think Gertie wanted to say something because there was feedback. I muted her again. I'm not sure whether she can unmute. Gertie, did you want to just complete with a, there you go. Well, I just, I just agree totally with uh, Charles. The whole system has to be re redone. How we do everything has to be rethought. Tom, Thomas Berry said it, our education system has failed us completely. So I totally agree with that. I'm on board. Yeah. Thank you. Charles for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, thank you yeah, for invoking Thomas Berry. And I would also add in Ivan Illich in this, in this regard. Uh, thanks, Gertie. And I think we just heard your voice, Evan. Was that correct? Oh, there you are. Yes, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And just segueing from that, I think it was Mark Twain who said, never let schooling interfere with your education. So mm -hmm. uh, thankful for educational opportunities like this and to continue to hear your words, Charles. Um, my question, I guess, is around your thoughts on uh, indigenous political movements, because I feel like a lot of, you know, the discussion today and that I've been kind of following really speaks to, and I'm learning this language and kind of um, educating myself on these kind of movements and, and thoughts, but kind of this re-indigenizing, right? Having us switch our consciousness and paradigm from separate from to a part of, and indeed indigenous to this planet where all of our atoms are coming from. And there's also, you know, all the solutions readily available to feed people to solve climate crisis. But it seems to be a question of distribution and access, which to me, seems to be a, an issue of power and power distribution. And recently, I've becoming more aware of indigenous political movements. Um, in America, they're often under the banner of land back and so kind of giving land trust back to uh, indigenous stewards. Um, and indeed with COP26, there have also been uh, indigenous leaders trying to have their voices heard um, within the larger kind of uh, power conversations. And so I'm just curious kind of your take on, you know, not only as individuals, but collectively, how maybe these kind of indigenous movements and this idea of re-indigenizing uh, might play a role uh, as far as changing the story and kind of changing our consciousness. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, what the indigenous are bringing to the conversation right now, when it is authentic, it should disturb us. Um, and I mean disturb in several senses of the word. Is like there's the mental disturbance, but it's also like the disruption of our narratives. I've seen quite a few attempts to enroll indigenous people in the climate movement to, to say basically, here is, you know, to join our side. Like, here's what you should care about. Here's what the problem is. Let me educate you about carbon dioxide and so on and so forth. I think to actually receive the gift that indigenous people have to offer right now, um, we have to stop primarily trying to educate them and trying to bring them into the dominant worldview. 
because that worldview is failing us. So um, like during the um, um, Dakota Access Pipeline um, movement, the indigenous people protecting their water were not doing it in the name of climate change. They were doing it because that water was sacred to them. The environmental movement thinks, well, that's convenient. You know, indigenous rights are really important now. And we can, can kind of use this to help achieve our goal, which is carbon reduction. And in a way, and I'm not saying every environmentalist did that, but, but collectively, that's kind of the, the utility of indigenous people to the environmental movement in some cases anyway. But what we really need to learn from them is actually it's to take their words at face value and not use sacredness as some kind of cipher for environmental sustainability, but to begin seeing the world in terms again of sacredness, to, to try on a radically different worldview. Because time and again, it has proved that what they hold sacred actually is environmentally essential. But even if it isn't, still, like, like we don't need to convert everything into our own worldview in order to accept it. Um, that's not actually respect. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, what comes to mind is, is um, some of the things that Kogi were saying in uh, this film, Aluna, that I wrote a review of it years ago. Um, but they were saying, you know, if you um, destroy the coastal wetlands, then the water is going to dry up in our mountains. And there was this hydrologist who's saying that's ridiculous. You know, water flows downstream, not upstream. You ignorant idiots, you know. But it turned out actually that they were right. And, and it wasn't because of a, because they were engaging in a coded understanding of modern hydrology. It was that they are in a completely different um, perceptual logic. And I'm not saying that we imitate that perceptual logic, but we um, adopt its first principle. And the first principle of indigenous perceptual logic is simply that everything is alive. That beingness is not just in the human being, but it's in the world. It's in the water, it's in the wind, it's in the mountain, it's in the earth. We are not alone here. We are part of a tribe of being. From that, the, that is where re-indigenization comes from. Really what indigenous means is it means of a place, you know, it means from here. How can you be from here if you are stranger to everything around you? Stranger because you don't even see it as a being. Indigenous people live in a world that is profuse with being. And that is, yeah, that's the only way to, and we all have an indigenous soul that, that understands this. Child, a child is quite comfortable with the idea that the sun is looking at you. And then we grow up and we think that's just a projection. You know, the scientific mind, well, the sun isn't looking at us. But some part of us still, when you're outside, you know it's true. The sun is looking at you. And somehow the sun knows what I'm doing and what I'm doing affects the sun. And wow, to bring that idea into the context of COP26 makes me seem like, you know, at best like a irrelevant poet and maybe just like a lunatic distracting us from the urgent matter at hand. But I, I know that if our revolution does not go that deep, then it will not actually be an effective revolution. It goes all the way to that level. And it is, another way to put it, it is the recovery of our indigenous soul. It is becoming, once again, in place, at home, among 
the circle of being of Earth. Yeah, beautiful. Evan, is that, yeah, we're at the end of our time. And Larissa, I see your hand and I think we won't be able to come to your question today. Do you at least? Just, just do it and I'll just give a super short answer. Not my okay, mind. exactly. I also, <laughs> Larissa, yeah, yeah. please speak. But one sentence question. It's not a question. It's uh, synchronistically a comment on um, the many um, challenging pieces of information that uh, Charles gave us today, which I welcome because I find um, truth telling to be very heartening and um, actually uh, encouraging, you know, in my in my own um, maintenance of some hope. But the, the part that I want to synchronistically comment on was that the full flight that uh, uh, we heard today, um, in which all these ideas could be shared with us, um, were, were contrasted in my mind with what we heard from Pat McCabe on Monday, when she was in full flight in you know, flying us, giving us a high level perspective over the, the river of blood that is colonial history. And I was appreciating very much uh, that um, level of um, knowledge and insight and uh, worldview that she was giving us using these indigenous um, multiple intelligences, not just the left brain intelligence of Western science and Western analysis, but the multiple intelligences of the indigenous worldview that, that see and feel everything that's around them. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's a very important part of us all appreciating that everything that has to be changed um, is really being able to look at that shadow of colonial history, which many of us are find difficulty in doing. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really have anything to say about it. I just, just, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, um, it's very, um, very much in line with with what I've been saying. So, yeah, thank you for bringing up the amazing Pat McCabe. Yeah. Yes. I'll show you a new team. Okay, thank you. We had a very strong conversation with her on Monday. Really teaching. Very very beautiful. Yeah, I found that so. Hmm refreshing was like having a shower after cop which is literally literally what i needed i came into the door of the flat like 10 minutes before this conversation happened and i needed a shower from cop 26 and that's what this was and thank you for reminding us of yeah the power of love the power of tending the power of pouring our love out where we are and with who we're with Charles and it for me it was a, a deep joy to be with spend time with you again mm. yeah really good to reconnect and um yeah thank you for giving me this opportunity to um to speak these words <laughs>